encourage you to ask any questions, stop me as I go, because this is intended to be interactive and casual. So thanks for being with us and I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let's see. <laughs> so nitrogen is something that we're all, we all deal with because it's part of who we are. It's in our DNA. It's part of the, the backbone. I'm trying to hide these little photos here so you don't see all of them and you can see the screen. Um, it's also an important component of chlorophyll and it's part of protein. So you eat uh, uh, nitrogen all the time when you're getting your protein. If you wanna get more specific and zoom in and look at the molecules, um, you can see nitrogen is part of where nitrogen comes into the protein. It's part of the backbone, the um, four base pairs um, that are in DNA. It's also in RNA and it's part of um, the pigment structure of chlorophyll. So, but really what we need to know is not only is it a building block of life, but plants and animals require it to grow. And the atmosphere that we breathe is mostly composed of nitrogen gas or N2. It's about 78% nitrogen. So without nitrogen, we would not be alive. But nitrogen in excess can take an ecosystem's balance and throw it off. Um, nitrogen plays a role in in the air, in the animals, in the plants, in the soil with the denitrifying bacteria, and in the water. It ha it's interconnected with fossil fuels, fossil fuel emissions, all the cycles of life. And you can think about nitrification, denitrification, nitrogen fixation, and all the components. This is looking at sort of the nitrogen cycle in the water. And what we need to understand is some forms of nitrogen are important um, to feed organisms or to help them grow, but given too much of one thing, it can be toxic and it can cause pollution. But nitrogen gas is inert and it's a natural part of the nitrogen cycle that if you have sort of all the components of the nitrogen web, the, the microbes, the bacteria, the archaea, the phytoplankton, the fish, the plants, the animals, nitrogen can stay in balance in that system. One form of nitrogen we all think about is what comes out in our own yards. Um, homes often have septic tanks rather than hooked up, being hooked up to the sewer. And if you have a septic tank um, and a leach field, some amount of your nitrogen in the form of ammonium and nitrate are coming out into the groundwater, um, first in the soil and then to the groundwater. And if you're by a pond or an estuary or a river, that's making it through to that um, water area, some amount of it. So one question we want to think about is where does the nitrogen come from? And to orient you, this is um, probably a pond you're all familiar with. Agritown Great Pond and the blue dots represent the stations where we, the collective we, specifically Julie, is water sampling uh, multiple times a week. Um, to the south in the barrier beach right here um, is where the breach is put. The breach is a cut in the barrier beach that's made manually by an excavator digging and removing the sand um, when, once the pond is above um, a certain height. Usually the pond's three and a half feet above sea level or more before it's cut so that the pond flows downhill and into um, the ocean. And it's not just about lowering the elevation of the pond when the cut happens, it's about lowering it and then creating a tidal exchange between ocean and pond. Organisms get exchanged, this nitrogen that can build up within the estuary gets reduced because the ocean, ocean is called oligotrophic. It has much less nitrogen um, than the pond itself. So this opening or cutting or breaching of the pond, which is made more efficient by dredging, which is moving the sediment that's north of the barrier beach, is a really important part of keeping Egertown Great Pond and other systems that are similar healthy. Groundwater flows in, the freshwater source, often at the heads of coves around the pond. So looking around um, the watershed, the sort of the groundwater impacts of this um, pond, we have a wastewater treatment facility. We have Morning Glory Farm. There's an organic golf club or vineyard golf club. There's Slough Farm. There's a high density development to the east. And by contrast to the west, there are large tracts of land can serve by individual homeowners, and there's also the state forest. The reason, it's kind of a tale of two sides, east and west. Um, the reason I want to highlight um, 
over here, the undeveloped land, is because that intact natural habitats have the ability to attenuate or transform nitrogen into a form that's not so harmful. If the sort of the cycle of life of the ecosystem is intact and the density is not very high, the nitrogen is not going to be um, a big problem for the ecosystem because the fungi, the bacteria, the archaea are going to work together in the plants and they have a natural system for transforming this nitrogen. The issue is when it's super dense um, in an area and we have more nitrogen than the normal natural intact environment can handle. Okay, so when we think about water quality and pond health, there's certain metrics or parameters that are set forth by the Massachusetts Estuary Program and also the EPA guidelines. That's a certain amount of oxygen, a pH that's um, near neutral, um, temperatures below 85 degrees. But what we're going to talk about mostly today is the nitrogen limit. And the total nitrogen set um, as a parameter for this pond is 0.5 milligrams per liter or less than 0.5 milligrams per liter. In other systems on the vineyard that are um, considered eelgrass supporting habitats, the nitrogen limit is lower, closer to 0.3, such as Senja Katakit. Um, when the nitrogen limit was set for Agritown Great Pond, it was set for a system that did not have um, eelgrass, except we all know there's a lot of eelgrass there. And if you talk to people who grew up around the pond, there historically was a lot of eelgrass. So this limit is actually a lot higher than is ideal for a system that supports eelgrass. And we want eelgrass for a number of reasons. It's a biodiversity hotspot. It's like a tropical rainforest in that lots of organisms live there and use it as habitat. Um, it sequesters carbon for hundreds to thousands of years. Um, it helps clear the water once it's there. It stabilizes sediments. Lots of really important things. So protecting this eelgrass is important and it's really tied into nitrogen. So let's get here. So here's one of the big plot. This is, uh, Julie made this plot using um, the Martha's Vineyard Commission's nitrogen data. Thank you, Sherry. Um, and what I want you to orient yourself with, I know there's a lot going on here, is anything shaded in red means it's above that 0.5 milligram uh, per liter limit. The dotted line represents that limit. And this black solid line is the trend. So all this scatter is the station um, per year. So we're starting in the 90s and going um, to current day. And this is the total nitrogen over here. So what you see is we were above the limit. We went below the limit. We went above the limit. And then this started, we have a certain absence of data. But in general, we're on a decreasing trend. And in recent years, we've been below the nitrogen target. So if we're below the nitrogen target, why are we worried about nitrogen? And Bob's going to tell us now about climate change, right? <laughs> he offered earlier. Are you ready, Bob? I'm just kidding. Ready when you are. <laughs> so what I want you to see here is from sort of the summer season is at the bottom of your screen from June to October, the warm season. And then you have your temperature in Fahrenheit over here. Um, we're looking at a logger that's installed in Lyles Bay. And what I want you to follow are the colors. Um, blue is 2018. And the limit here of 85 degrees below 85 is, is healthy. Above 85 is not ideal. So in 2018, our warmest temperature happened in August. In 2019, our warmest temperature happened in July. So this was right after we had a pond cut and then a heat wave. And we exceeded our 85 degree limit. What happened in both of these years is we had an algal bloom. We'll get more into that later, or get into more of that later. But what I want you to see is we also have two peaks of heat um, in 2019. This is our data looking at 2020. 2020 is in black, and it's a cooler in general summer. Um, but it's still quite warm. The pond's in the 80s right now. I think it was 82 when I checked it this afternoon. Hmm. All right. So another lovely figure courtesy of Julie. You can see this figure in um, our recently released ecosystem monitoring program report. Um, what we need to know is why the algal blooms happen. And they happen because when nitrogen or phosphate, depending on your system, salt water systems are generally um, the limiting nutrient is nitrogen. Um, when they have enough of that fertilizer and you turn up the heat, 
macro or micro algal blooms can happen. And that's basically they catalyze the abundant or overgrowth of these organisms. Algae is present in the water. That's not a big deal. It's when they grow and they outcompete other things and they start to dominate an environment. And microscopic algae are things you're going to have to look on um, under a microscope to identify what they are. Macro algae are big filamentous things you can grab in your hands. Okay, so moving you guys around. This is an aerial shot looking at the southeast corner of Agritown Great Pond. This loose way would be over here for orientation. The cut would be this way. Algal blooms happen when you have enough heat and enough fertilizer. So Bob, can you turn down the climate for us? Can you cool it down? Do you have that ability? I do. Okay, well, please do, because then we don't have to worry about the nitrogen. But the, if you're the, taking the-, the, the what, what year was this? Out of work. <laughs> what, what year was this picture? This Emma? is a photo from 2018. In 2018, 2018, the bloom sort of started in this southeast corner and spread to some other regions. In 2019, we also had a green filamentous macroalgal bloom. Didn't take over the whole pond, but started showing up in different places. What happened in 2019 that didn't happen in 2018 is it showed up earlier because the pond got hotter earlier. Has David Letterman seen this picture? Um, I think so. Hopefully you didn't use it as a uh, holiday card though. No. Okay, so let's see. So this is, if you look at um, sort of macroalgae, you can see it from above. You can see uh, microalgae from above for that case. But if you start to look um, more clearly, see the lines through this al algae, this filamentous algae? Those are prop scars. So someone's prop was covered in algae. If you take it out of the water, it looks a bit like, um, who's that green character? The Grinch. It feels like one of those like polyester toys. It's really a bizarre thing. Um, so we had this naive idea that we could take it out of the water. But um, if you are really going to combat a large biomass of algae, you need like a harvester that floats and other um, estuaries that are dealing with frequent and widespread algal blooms actually do invest in such an instrument. I just saw on Instagram today, our sister pond, Georgica Pond in the Hamptons was doing that and they were harvesting it. So let's be thankful that we don't have to do this all the time and that we don't have invasives all the time that we're dealing with that are killing the pond. In general, Agritown Gray Pond is doing quite well. We have issues to deal with, we have climate change, and what we're trying to avoid is something called eutrophication. And that's when you have so much of the fertilizer or the um, nitrogen or phosphorus leaching into your water system that algae is blooming all the time and you get into this cycle of decay. When the algae dies, the, um, the, the microbes that are in the sediment suck out the oxygen, you have a hypoxic system and if it's too widespread your fish can eventually die um, and other organisms in the system. This is what we want to avoid. Agritown Great Pond is not eutrophic. We're trending in the right direction, but we still have challenges and need nitrogen reduction because we can't rely on Bob all the time to stop the heating up. Yeah. This okay, so this is what we want to avoid. You never want to be this, the pond that's shown and this is what we want to avoid. So we did, went off island for our photos. So this is Georgica Pond. This is a south-ish south facing beach in um, the Hamptons. It's a bit of a smaller system than Agritown Great Pond. And it also, they've been starting, they started their restoration work more recently. And so they have, they've got more issues they're dealing with. They have higher density of housing around the pond in a smaller system. And when you're dealing with eutrophication, the more dense housing and the less volume of water, the harder the, the pressure is on your environment. And that was a blue-green algae bloom, so that's microalgae. This is a macroalgal bloom. And we've had some of this, but we haven't, taking, haven't had it take over the entire pond. This is another image of the floating macroalgae. And what we want to avoid is having the pond closed to swimming and to fishing because of the health. This is something they've dealt with. Um, and recently, the DEP just delisted Agritown Great Pond um, for shell fishing, which is even more conservative than swimming limits. So that means we're trending in the right direction. Back in 92, um, the Great Pond was put on the impairment list for, uh, for the, by the DEP. And so in 2020, it was listed for the first time. Okay, so this is a picture of our water in Agritown Great Pond. We are pretty lucky. It's not perfect all the time, but we have many moments of beautiful clarity and health. This is a, a 
GoPro image of eelgrass and shellfish and snorkeling through eelgrass in June is a really glorious thing. So if you've got the time, go out there. This is another really extensive meadow. This is in Lyles Bay um, and it's quite lovely and it's teeming with life. You can find all kinds of wonderful organisms in there. There's your biodiversity hotspot. What I want to remember is that at the same time we have these thriving parts of the pond, there are some pots, parts that can be struggling. And it's not just certain coves that are struggling, but year to year a place that's doing well can have trouble in the next year because eelgrass is really an indicator of overall health of a system. If it gets too fresh, that can damage the eelgrass if we're not getting enough salinity recently. If it gets too turbid or too murky and we can't get light penetrating to the bottom where the eelgrass is, that's gonna reduce the health of the eelgrass because it can't photosynthesize efficiently. So what, this is some macroalgae growing on the eelgrass. And again, it's not a blanket covering everything, but it exists. What we wanna do is help kind of get our trend even better by reducing the overall nitrogen because we can't stop the heating up of the pond, but we can, can reduce the nitrogen. So I'm gonna focus on ways to do that. So this is just sort of images of the pond. These are all the same pond, but they're two different years. Um, if we look right here, this is June 24th, 2019, and this is June 22nd, 2018. And what you see is this is a, um, a bloom, not an overgrowth of um, phytoplankton, but there is phytoplankton that's reducing the clarity of the water, reducing the ability of light to reach the bottom. And right after this, we said to the town, we're really concerned about the health of the eelgrass. It's got stuff growing on it. The light's not penetrating the bottom. It's really an important time for a cut. And they were great. They cut the pond and it was wonderful because it lowered it and it got the light to the eelgrass so we could maintain it. Okay, so moving you guys all around so I can still see you. We do have a problem. The challenge is we're meeting the standards and following the management recommendations that have been set forth for this pond. The total nitrogen is below that 0.5 milligram per um, a liter limit. We have regular openings. We've had effective dredging program um, for over a decade. The problem is eelgrass is still struggling in places that were expanding sometimes or declining. Um, temperatures are uh, exceeding 85 degrees from time to time in different regions of the pond from year to year. Blooms, macroalgal blooms happened in 2018. And this is another picture from 2018 to orient you that swan neck. We also started to see low DO in 2019 um, throughout the stations on the pond. It wasn't just a little bit here and a little bit there, but that was the algae was decaying and our dissolved oxygen, which is another indicator of ecosystem health, sort of its ability to breathe, um, we saw getting low. This year it's not widespread low um, as much. J Julie, see, you said you were seeing it at station three or deepest station pretty often um, in low DO, but the rest, is that right? So that's by yeah. your house, Bob. Um, Boldwater Point um, is pretty deep. Um, we're over three and a half meters usually when the pond's high, and that's not unusual to have such a deep site um, have DO drop. But of course we want happy oxygen everywhere all the time, but we're not there yet. So back to the pond as a whole, back to sort of sources of potential nitrogen. What I want um, to, what we need to think about sort of as we're trying to protect our ponds is what's happening in our watershed, what's happening within um, the sub embayments, what's happening in the groundwater that's affecting this pond, that's flowing to this pond. These blue lines represent sub watersheds. So everything inside this bubble kind of channels down into this part of the pond and so forth and so on. Um, and this is uh, the, Egertown roof prints. So if you want to think about housing density, look at the pink. That's where the houses are. And the parcels that are on sewer are in this kind of gold color. So notice one thing. These homes within the watershed are hooked up to the wastewater treatment plant. That's great because they're not on septic. They're getting downgraded. Their nitrogen is uh, less so before it comes into our groundwater. But outside the watershed, all these homes in yellow are feeding back into the watershed of Egertown Great Pond as well. So it's sort of it's the wastewater treatment plant, you have to think about it two ways. Great that it's downgrading 
um, the wastewater here, but we're also getting wastewater from all these parcels and we're getting um, pump trucks from other towns going into the wastewater treatment plant that's pumping into Egertown Great Pond. And although the effluents downgraded, it's a, a tertiary system, which is modern and what we want to see, it doesn't downgrade the phosphate. It doesn't deal with the pharmaceuticals. It doesn't deal with a lot of things. And so everybody's waste in yellow is coming to our watershed. So this is a figure taking the same data, but we started to work with the EPA and a hydrologist there. Um, and Chris Seidel at the Martha's Vineyard Commission helped us get all this data together. And we all started to look and they helped us identify putative nitrogen hotspots, three of them in particular. Um, and different strategies are needed to combat density in different ways. Thankfully, with time, we have new and more effective ways to handle nitrogen. They uh, indicated that perhaps um, this area right here uh, that has high density could be a place where alternative septic systems could be used. And that's, we have to evaluate and look at the groundwater and make sure that this is a hotspot. These are just putative because they're based on what the density is. But this is a, a good educated guess and this type of guessing has been used to help restore estuaries on the Cape. So alternative um, septics are something that we're gonna talk about in cocktails and conversations next week with John Smith. And he's an engineer that's installing systems right now on the vineyard that are currently permitted. There are lots of different types of alternative systems. Um, the trick is making sure they're permitted in your area and there's enough data that says that they're effective and they're monitored. This area right here around Slough Cove, which has historic impairment in the, the water quality, is a potential spot they said could be good for a permeable reactive barrier. And Sherry can tell us all about that. Um, she's been installing a barrier on uh, Tisbury or on the lagoon. Is that how's that going, Sherry? Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button. It's going really well. We've put out the per, the contract and we've got, we've narrowed it down to two contractors, and we hope to be permitting and put it in within the next couple months. That's so exciting. So it's so great. It'll give us another tool. Yay, so permeable, and that's great that it's on island and you'll get the data. Permeable reactive mm -hmm. barriers put in carbon sources that help transform harmful nitrogen into nitrogen gas. What carbon source did you guys go with? We're going to do with the, um, the emulsified vegetable oil. It's, um, it's, it's, they put something in it to emulsify it to, to make it stickier so that the oil will stay in one place. Wonderful. But the vegetable oil is less invasive. Um, the, the wood chips, they're, most, of the, um, most of the contractors are getting away from those because the um, wood chips are just, it's really invasive because you have to dig a whole trench. And we're looking at things that, you know, if you put this along a beach, you don't want to dig a big trench and then fill it back in with um, wood chips. So the oil is pretty much the cutting edge that they're using. So we'll, we'll see how well it works in a couple of months. Right. It'll be great. We'll look okay. forward to hearing. And this area right here is near the wastewater treatment plant. So one strategy for targeting that would be potentially hooking up homes that are currently, they currently have septic hooking up to the wastewater treatment plant. Sorry for the really poor quality figure, but this is the data we have. Um, all these homes indicated in red are homes that currently have the infrastructure in place and could be hooked up to the wastewater treatment plant. The number is 138, 29, 10, 155. They represent three or 400 homes that could potentially be hooked up to the wastewater treatment plant and their septic effluent could be really um, downgraded. So that's one potential source um, or one potential way to reduce the nitrogen within the watershed. So one thing people always ask is what can you do? Um, choosing native landscapes, having um, ecosystems that are intact as much as we can encourage that in people's individual lawns, having a vineyard lawn, or having less impermeable surfaces, uh, or having less, more natural driveways, less impermeable surfaces, the more intact our habitats are, the more we can sort of encourage that natural ecosystem attenuation of nitrogen. There's lots of great tips in um, the Island Blue Pages. If you want to find this, you can find it on the Commission's website. You can find it on our website by typing in Blue Pages in the search bar. If you go inside, 
There's tips on what you can do for landscaping, things in your watershed, ways to reduce uh, water usage, hazards, all kinds of stuff. A bunch of nonprofits on the vineyard worked hard to put this together, so there's a wealth of information. Um, using phosphate-free products is also suggested. Another thing that's important is supporting local land conservation. The more conserved land we have around our waterways, um, the less nitrogen that goes in, the happier the animals are. You can ask Luann about habitat corridors. Um, but they also just have an ability because nature is pretty amazing. The less we mess with it, um, sort of the less problems we have downstream. Another thing we can do is get informed. So thank you for being here, for participating in this. Um, and we're hoping that you can join us for um, some of our future series, uh, speaking with John Smith, um, who's an engineer, and also Kevin Banks, who's a superintendent of the Vineyard um, Golf Club. And he speaks around the world about um, green practices for um, organic landscape, ways that to be a bit gentler on the environment and protect it. Um, and now I want to open it up to you guys because this is not supposed to all be me talking. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can focus on all your faces. Um, does anyone have questions, thoughts to add? Are we taking, Bob, is it your turn for the climate change presentation? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, okay. We'll be back here. Come on. I have a question, Emily. Okay. Uh, so I'm curious with the, um, the hotspots that you identified as places where you might be able to attenuate some of the nitrogen by changing septic systems or practices there. Does, does your pond station data tell you anything about those hotspots or when the nitrogen comes into the pond, is it too attenuated to limit it to a station? Those are two kind of separate questions. So um, historically and currently, different um, parts of the ecosystem, parts of the pond, different coves have, are healthier than others. Um, Meshacket, which is where the wastewater treatment facility is, and Slough Cove, a lot of things that are on the eastern shore, they have water quality that's not as good as other places, and they, although it's not terrible because the whole pond has circulation, but there are longer term measures that tell us that there's a history of impairment. If you look at the carbon composition in the sediments in those places with historic water quality impairment, there's more carbon. That means there have been blooms that have decayed and instead of having just a sandy sediment, you have a lot of mm. um, decayed life left over. Uh, you also have less eelgrass in some places um, because of the historical impairment. If you wanna understand, is that nitrogen coming in? to the pond? Are we seeing it in our water quality data? One way to evaluate that, not only just looking at groundwater, and that's something we should do, but you could take um, point samples of the water, analyze the nitrogen when the pond is low. We're not tidal that much, so you'd have to have it kind of low tide, low pond, um, and look at what the nitrogen concentration is at the heads of those coves, and that's something that we do want to do. And that gives us sort of an, equate, an understanding of what's in the groundwater. It's not exactly, and we need to look at that too, but that would answer some of your question and our yeah, questions. Right. So excellent question. Other questions? Hey, Bob. Emily, when you look at the, when the, uh, the hottest uh, period or time date uh, for the pond uh, occurs uh, from one year to the next, wouldn't that be significantly affected by the timing of openings? Excellent question, and yes, it can be. Um, last year, we saw something unusual. Normally, we see peak temperature in August. Um, we've had a, a lot of time to heat up, um, and we usually see it around mid-August, but in 2019, because the cut happened um, right before a heat wave, the pond heated up very quickly. So we had, when you're at low pond, that means the volume of your water is less, and so it can heat up a lot more quickly. Um, so the pond actually heated up in July to two peak heats, one close to 85 degrees and one exceeding 85 degrees in July instead of August last year. So normally when you think of making a breach in the pond and bringing in that nice salty water that's clean, we think, yeah, it's great and it's going to lower the temperature because the ocean's cooler than the pond. The problem is the pond stayed low and then we had, was it three or more days of 90 degrees? It might have even been a week and the pond really heated up. Um, and there's a relate, an inverse relationship between um, heat and the ability of oxygen to be dissolved in water. 
And also the same is true for salinity. So the salty ocean water, the low volume meant that we could physically less oxygen could be present. And that was a factor that probably led to the widespread low dissolved oxygen in addition to decaying algae in 2019. Mm. Do you have more thoughts, Julie? Because I just realized you can answer these questions and I can drink wine. <laughs> yeah, that was great. I, I have nothing to add. That was good. Can you tell us what you're seeing in, in right now in 2020 around the pond? Because you do monthly reports that I have not been, I've been enjoying your work, but I haven't shared it widely enough. What are you seeing? Because everyone needs an update. Okay. Um, yeah, so I go out twice a week. And this year, it's been cooler than 2019. Um, I don't know if you noticed on that temperature plot, but the black line was 2020. And it was actually a lot lower than 2019, especially in July. Um, it has been hot recently, so um, I think August will be our peak temperatures. But we're not seeing the same widespread low dissolved oxygen like we saw last year. There are a few stations that are deeper and it's more difficult for the oxygen to penetrate into the deeper depths. So um, the, the deep stations do still have some low dissolved oxygen, but mostly it's a healthy ecosystem. There's been some phytoplankton, so microscopic algae blooms. Uh, if you're on the pond, you might notice it's a little more cloudy and water looks green, and that's from the phytoplankton. But that is totally normal and probably related to the higher temperatures that we've had recently. So we're hoping for a cut soon. Uh, the salinity is a lot lower than last year. Um, it's about 12 to 13 parts per thousand, and the ocean is about 30, 32 parts per thousand. So we want it to be in the 20s. So it's, we're, we're overdue for rain and for a cut, and hopefully we can get that in the next couple weeks and get the salinity up. Is, is it 12 to 13 down by the south part of the pond? Yeah, it's probably about 13, 14 in the south part of the pond, but yeah, it's still very low over there. We don't normally see it this low this type of year, but uh, this time of year, but the last two cuts have not increased the salinity a lot. Um, and this is following a year without dredging. And so now that we, it's the good and the bad, we have a natural experiment to see what the pond circulation was like with dredging, which means the salinity was reaching all the coves and getting about plus 10, plus 13, plus, I don't remember the highest um, change in parts per thousand. Um, but with the most recent cuts, the coves were not salting up. And that means our seawater was not flushing them and was not um, reaching all corners of the pond and raising the overall or average salinity. Yeah, which has been a, which was a concern way back when before we even bought the little Nessie dredge, right? Was how much salinity were we getting down Jane's Cove, down Winchester or, or Wentucket Cove? I don't know, how's the cove where Yale and and Zev live. Uh, I kayak down there and station not, eight. Mm -hmm. I'm telling Julie station eight, so she knows where to. Okay, all right. It it just seemed uh, 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 a little thicker than some other places when you went all the way down to the end. And uh, uh, I don't know if if, if uh, that's a, an area that's struggling struggling relatively. But the place that seems to be really thick and hasn't gotten better in a long time, is it called Job's Neck Pond? It's the little bitty pond. That, what do you mean by thick? Uh, lots of growth in uh, coming up, you know. And so when you're, when you're kayaking through, I mean, you're, you're feeling it in your paddle, you know. Right. Uh, uh, and it's, it's by far the thickest this year and has been many, you know by far many years now in that job's neck area i i don't know if there was even some sort of shoveling which is what was done in the old old days and uh or dredging of some sort to open that up but while the pond's gotten better that little job's neck pond hasn't jacob's neck has had frequent algal blooms 
Um, yeah. And that is, I think, of concern. That's something we sampled a little bit, but not enough. I think Julie's planning to go out there with our intern, Ben, in the next week or so um, mm -hmm. and get some data. But that's, again, an isolated body of water that's more shallow, and so it's more susceptible for inc to increasing temperatures. Um, we don't have total nitrogen for there, uh, but that's something I think we're going to do is take, once the labs in Woods Hole are accepting samples again, um, take a nitrogen sample there because uh, you're dealing with two things. You want to know, is there nitrogen driving the growth or is it just the temperature? It does, how does the nitrogen compare to Egertown Great Pond? Where are you? And because we know the temperature is definitely higher. So when you go down, be careful. There's a couple of uh, very protective of young swans down at the very end of that pond. And they let, they let you know when you're getting anywhere near them. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the warning. So Emily, I have a question. So um, you mentioned that our target for the nitrogen is 0.5 or less, but that it really should be 0.3 or less. Do we make any efforts to hit the 0.3 target or is that just not even possible? Right now, okay, so when I talked to the EPA about this, they said, you want to lower your limits? Uh, yeah, no right. one does that. That's crazy. And uh, so we would need to talk to the DEP. We'd need to talk to the Martha's Vineyard Commission. We'd need to talk to a lot of people that are responsible for setting those limits, and that's part of our plan. We've got the data, but oftentimes the science isn't at this, it happens faster than the changes in the regulations. And mm -hmm. so we need to advocate for lowering that nitrogen because we have a habitat um, that needs lower nitrogen to protect our eel grass. I see. I see. Okay. Does that you. answer your question? It does. It does. Thank you. I wish science, like the data, informed management decisions immediately, but that mm -hmm. is one that's politics interfacing with science, and it, mm -hmm. it slows things down a little bit. That's all you have to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, if there are no more questions, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for making this time and um, for caring about our local waters. This is really important. This is thank you, Emily. Emily. Thank, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Emily. For all you guys do to make the pond a great place. I mean, it's uh, it's it really is a great place, and it's become a great place because a whole bunch of folks like you have worked your tails off in enabling it to be so. So, uh, great work. Keep it up. Yeah, we're very grateful. Thank you. Our pleasure, Th and thank you, Joe, because I know you were doing it long before we all started. Mm -hmm. Well, not really, but anyway, I'm, I'm not that old, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, have a good evening, everyone. Thanks have for evening. having yeah. cocktail hour. Take care. Yep. Thank bye you. Bye-bye.